Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Podcast. I am Race for the Prize. Let's look at the Cup Series, Martinsville. Review the salaries. Who's going to be the best value play coming into this week? Who are the best point per dollar plays at the top? But first, remember, raceforthepries.com. You need to join. Join us. PayPal, Venmo, Cash App. Join us in the spreadsheet. I love doing the spreadsheet. I love doing these podcasts. I love sharing it with you, sharing all of the data, making your life easier, making it easier to play fancy NASCAR, saving you tons of time. Join the revolution. We're building something here, folks. Be a part of that. Something special. You want to be with us. I want to share it with you. I'm loving what I'm doing. Let's keep that love rocking. And here we go. What I'm going to do first, because I value your time, I'm going to quickly run through and just say, do I like these guys or not? Zero, two, they're not in my pool, two, four, I really like this play this week. Then we will double back and give a little bit deeper analysis on the picks. You're welcome. So zero for David Starr and Carl Long. <clears throat> I will barely consider Josh Williams. Here is your reminder, if you go back to the last eight Martinsville races, only three times do we have a pure punt. So. There have been occasions where you take that guy in the super low fives to pay up for lap leaders, for hogs, for dominators. It is on the table. And so we will get a little bit of Daniel Hemrick as a possibility and Kaz Grala. I'll even elevate Harrison Burton, dare I say it, up to, well, not a three, but a two. We're going to go zero to three. Three being I really like this play. Two being, okay, I'm cool with it. One, like, uh, zero is just not in my pool. Justin Haley, if we're going to like Casgrala at the very least, again, the deciding factor will be starting position for these jokers. Zane Smith, as I've said before, I don't believe in this car. I don't think it's a real deal car. Spire just went and got a third car. This is a track house driver. Throwing together a team, don't believe in him. Corley Joy may be able to get bumped up to a two because he has been halfway decent at Martinsville. All right, we're going to go quick. I speed it up. Uh, Carson Hosever, I'm really not excited about these guys this week at Spire, based on what they did last week. Ricky Stenhouse will give a one. Todd Gillen, I'm going to give a three. Michael McDowell, I'll give a two. Cindric, two, almost a three. Nima Check, a one. Eric Jones, going to give a three. Again, we'll go back and explore these a little bit later. I'll give a three to Austin Dillon. We'll come back. In a little bit, one for Daniel Suarez. We'll give Gregson a two because he's still affordable. We'll give Priest a two. We'll give Josh Berry a two. Got to give a three to Chase Briscoe at that price. Got to give a three to Bo Wallace at that price. And I'm going to give Bowman a slightly lower bump at two, but he is in that category. You can see I've got him categorized together. Kyle Busch is just going to be a two, which is unbelievable. What, 8,100? We'll debate that a little bit later. Ross Chastain, a one. Tyler Reddick, a one. And almost zeros there. Chris Bush will get a, I'll give him a one as well. But I reserve the right to come back and change that pick at any time. Chase Elliott, two. Uh, you're going to see it's green highlighted. I was really excited about it, but I've kind of stepped back a little bit. We'll talk about that later. I worry about Elliot in this new package that we've had the last two seasons and if it's kind of sucked all the uh, zapped him a little bit. Ty Gibbs at 9,000, two, he's fine. Brexowski, give him a two, he's fine. We'll boost Logano up because we like the way they ran last week. Yeah, you're going to need these guys. I'm going to downgrade Blaney a little bit. Should I? Should I not? Should I? Yeah, I'm going to downgrade him a little bit just because JGR and Hendrick have ruled the world. So there's your real quick run through of where I'm seeing drivers, point per dollar wise, who I consider playing. Got a little bit of a sore throat. It's not very fun. So bear with me. All right, we'll go back to the bottom and we'll explore a little bit further where I'm leaning, why I'm leaning, and look at track history and some of our stats. So David Starr doesn't really need much of an explanation. We're not going to play a Carl Long car. We can have a conversation about Josh Williams running double duty. It is a colored car. Have the colored cars been good this year? They haven't. We look at what Daniel Hemrick was last week. Not very strong at Richmond. Had a struggle session at Phoenix. Yeah, there were some issues, but once he did get back on the lead lap, he really didn't do anything. 
but you cannot completely erase them because if we simply go back to last week at Richmond and we look at the Alton lineup, there it is, the 20th most fantasy points with an average running position of 28th, Ty Dillon in the optimal lineup. So if Ty Dillon worked out last week for Richmond, then of course Josh Williams could work this week. Daniel Hemrick could work this week. I mean, just ask yourself, could Josh Williams score 18 fantasy points? Yeah, he could. Could Daniel Hemrick? Yeah, he very well could. And if we have to end up paying up for some expensive hogs or dominators, then look, you just cannot completely erase those drivers. And simply the one that's starting the furthest back, you hope that the race plays out well, they make the right adjustments. Maybe they are in group A or B and that kind of skews their data a little bit. And so they find something, who knows, but you leave them on the board. Now, you know, we're kind of splitting hairs at this point, which is pretty amazing between Colleg and Rick Ware. In years past, it would be easy. We'd just go with the Colleg cars. But Rick Ware's been noticeably better. And, I mean, if I had my druthers, we'll talk about Harrison Burton in a second. Haley versus Growla versus Hemrick. And as I've said before, I'm crossing off Zane Smith. This is a third Spire car. They just have an extra charter. So they went out and track house, gave them Zane Smith. They got a random crew chief. And the results have pretty much shown us that. This is a bit of a thrown together ride. Feel bad for Zane. I don't know what he's doing or what he was expecting. But this is just a year he has to go through, I suppose. Maybe it's similar to... Remember when Clint Boyer lost his ride when Michael Waltrip Racing fell apart and he had to wait a season before he could sign on with Stuart Haas and he ran that year with H. Scott Motorsports? Perhaps that's what Zane Smith is going through at the moment. Perhaps he was told that he would get a ride. He just has to kind of bite his time, bite his tongue. Either way, Zane Smith, not on the board. Haley, Grala, Hemrick are... Haley is the guy. And obviously, heading into this season, there were rather high expectations for Haley. Well, actually, not high expectations. There was a lot of interest about his decision to leave Colleg and to go over to Rick Ware. Everyone said, boy, that seems like a step backwards or a lateral transition, and no one really could understand. Like, oh, well, maybe Rick Ware is putting something together. You know, Rick Ware has been improving over the years. There was a lot of questions circulating. But now where we stand, it seems like it makes a little bit of sense. It seems that Haley and Rick Ware knew things that we didn't know. I mean, if I was a betting man, Haley was aware that Colleg was probably downsizing, downgrading, not investing the same way that they once were. He needed to get out of a sinking ship. And although he may not have jumped on to the beta, you know, onto a yacht, he at least got better than a life preserver. He got onto a dinghy or something. But it looks like that lateral move actually was probably the best move for him because the way that it seems, Colleg is shifting these resources around or may not be on the up and up. And that kind of makes sense of why we may have seen Haley doing so well, and then you've got Hemrick, you got Williams getting into the car occasionally. Uh, maybe Colleg made it clear that we're really just going to spend our money on plate races and at road courses in the Cup Series or wherever, just try to win races, go trophy hunting, and then punt the rest. And possibly Haley didn't like that and said, I got a better chance of winning weekly or improving weekly if I go to Rick Ware. Either way, long story short, I like Haley in this group, and he has been a driver that we've gone to a couple times this year, and it worked out at Phoenix where he actually finishes better than where he runs, and then the reverse happens at Richmond where he finishes worse than where he actually ran. It is a pun, it's a value pick, it is a Rick Ware car, so these are the things that you're just going to have to come to expect and things that you're going to have to come to accept. No Smith, LaJoy. Spire did not run particularly well last week. If we look at LeJoy, we look at Hosever, and then obviously Zane Smith, 
Now they have to take three cars, which is probably already a stressor on them, and then set them up for Martinsville. And the only good news is that in the past, LaJoy has been pretty strong and steady. He qualified really well here last year, but I guess this is worth a reminder about your classic Group A, Group B situation where the, well, let me pull it up. If I go to last year's practice data. So that's the laps, as you can see on the screen. We're going to go to the bottom because he did not finish well. But look at those speeds in practice when the track was green. And then he had to go out and qualify. Not so good. And we've seen these situations already unfold this season. Now, if the ambient temperature is not too bad this week in Martinsville, which it actually it's looking like 60s, maybe lower, the track may not take rubber. So the difference between Group A and Group B may not be as severe. We'll see. Just got to wait and see on that one. Either way, LaJoy probably going to be a little bit higher on my – I mean, he's definitely going to be higher on my board right now where we stand compared to Hosever. Based on experience, when you look, those aren't the greatest finishes. But can LaJoy hang on to the lead lap? Yes. Can he score 20 fantasy points? Yes, if need be. And, you know, hopefully, I don't think we're going to have to double punt. We'll see. I haven't really ran through a lineup builder. It's just a matter of where he's going to qualify. Either way, he has experience. He's produced decent results. Experience factor. Harrison Burton, we haven't talked about yet. He's the guy that you're kind of leaning on the most. But in reality, when push comes to shove and we're making our decisions based on who's going to be the best value play, uh, these finishes aren't going to matter as much as the starting position. The closer LaJoy starts to the front, the more his value is going to fade. And the more these guys start in the back, which they absolutely are going to do, the more their value is going to increase. If we're just trying to get 20 points, we're looking for the easiest route to 20 points. And that might not be the case for Corey LaJoy. If he starts 20th and then finishes 22nd, you lose. If he starts 22nd and he finishes 26th, you lose. Now, if Daniel Hemrick starts 35th and finishes 28th, you're almost there. So that's the way that shapes up, and you save some money in the process. Um, Hosever. 31st last year, it's very disappointing, really didn't have anything. Uh, if we look at his Martinsville races, they're not great, but if you were to inspect this 34th place finish a little bit closer, Hosever was running seventh last fall at Martinsville, with like three laps remaining, and he got wrecked. So, yeah, the 34 looks bad, but he had a top 10 car or truck. So, he's got experience, he knows what he's doing. Um, it's not a terrible play, but... A lot of these plays are just not good plays. They're not fun plays. They're not exciting plays. Now for the fun, exciting play of Harrison Burton. Are you guys having fun? I'm having fun. I love doing this. Love sharing this with you. Please consider joining RaceForThePrize.com. You need to be a part of this. I want you to be a part of this. I want to make it easy. I want to share. Uh, just something that I think will be very good for you save you some time harrison burton all right here we go can't avoid it anymore so obviously 15th and 12th at martinsville in the last two seasons it's better than anyone that we got in the back harrison burton grew up down the road in the south side of virginia at sobo hometown track ish the wood brothers if you're going in the opposite direction on 58 West, you Southerners know what I'm talking about, especially if you have been to Martinsville. Runs right past the track. You take 58 West through the mountains down to Stewart, Virginia, the home of the Wood Brothers. So this track is a meaningful place to them. To him, he's won the Xfinity Series. He's produced decent results. Changed crew chiefs over the years from Jeremy Boland's. Brian Wilson, but he has had success at Martinsville and at plenty of tracks under both. They're both decent crew chiefs. We loved Brian Wilson, the Xfinity Series. So, you know, there's a lot of good things going. The bad thing is, he is not running well this year. 
Maybe you give him a little bit of credit for this Bristol race, but this car just does not look good. He does not look good. Oh boy. But if there is a place where he can turn it around, it could quite possibly be at Martinsville. Will he stink forever? I can't imagine that this allied Penske Ford will stink forever. He's got to turn around at some point. This is a great opportunity for him to do that. Now, we go even closer because we've got these two races that we don't like so much. So if we look at the 23 spring race, at the very least, he was running 26 before he got spun out. Yeah, I know that's not much of a compliment, but maybe if he doesn't get wrecked, possibly he's at least a top 25 car. Not bad. Now we look at the next situation. In the 22 spring race, he was also almost the optimal pick. He was one spot away. I believe it was Ty Dillon who ended up being the optimal play for Legacy Motor Club. And Harrison Burton missed out on that by like two position points. Which really isn't much of a stretch. If he finishes 26, if he gets to 24th, remember I said earlier, well, if Danny Hemrick goes from 35th to 28th, or, you know, 33rd to 26th, it's pretty close. You're almost there. Last week we had Ty Dillon hit at 18 fantasy points. You're telling me you can't get 18 fantasy points for Harrison Burton? That can work. He's the guy I like back here. I know the results have been bad, but that's fine. Let that scare people away. Let people value finishing position more. Oh, well, actually, his driver rating's been bad, too. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's true. But people definitely love looking at finishing position, and that heavily influences. And sometimes it should because the results are the results. Sometimes you need to take your fancy analytics and shove them. And sometimes we want to really dig into the fancy analytics and really use them to predict different outcomes. And so here's a stupid idea that I've been considering. It just popped into my head listening to another podcast, and I don't, I'm not political. We're not getting political, so don't freak out. But I can use this analogy maybe to help process some information and help you out. I'm not trying to change your mind about anything. I don't even really care about any of this. But there's this idea of DEI and affirmative action in which, okay, now people are turning off. Look, just, just bear with me for a second. The idea is that because of discrimination or whatnot or a race, some people are disadvantaged, and so we need to remove those disadvantages to see, and you put them in another position. Where none of it really works. We got it. We know. I know you guys all hate it. I know it's a failure, but it doesn't work in practice or in application. I got it. Okay, cool. We're not getting political. But let's just talk about it from the theoretical idea. Now, from the theoretical idea, as we look at someone or something that has been disadvantaged or has been in a disadvantageous spot, and the idea is if you were to put that person or thing or subject that has been in a disadvantageous spot and put it in a more advantageous position, then it will reach full potential. I think the easiest way to describe this to get out of the politics realm, because I know people are freaking out. Oh my God, he lost it. He went political. He's ruined the podcast. No, I didn't. Stop. Stop. I love you guys. I wouldn't do that to you. I did that back in 2019. Somehow I was talking about protectionism and central planning. And boy, did the comments let me know on that one. So we're not doing politics. Think of it this way. A pitcher for Colorado, his stats, his numbers stink. He is in a disadvantageous spot. Now, if you were to put that pitcher in a more advantageous spot, let's say a pitcher's park facing a team that strikes out a lot, we would expect those numbers to change and that pitcher to reach their full potential. In essence, that's the theoretical idea of DEI and affirmative action. Now, we all know that in reality, that's not what happens, and that's not the game that's being played, and it's much more superficial. But theoretically, what we do in fantasy sports and what we do as advanced analytic people will say, all right, this person is underperforming because of these issues but if you put them in this situation they could be successful so that goes to the harrison burton deep conversation of how about this thought burton's not producing well but has he been in an advantageous spot 
or is this really kind of a rough schedule to go through, especially for a small team? We're traveling all over God's green earth, Daytona, Atlanta. Now we're out west. Now we're in the Smoky Mountains. Now we're going back to Texas. Now we're back to Virginia. So we're traveling everywhere for the Wood Brothers. Not very advantageous for a one-car team. Next thing. Plates. Oh, intermediate. Oh, no, new short track package. Oh, no, back to intermediate at a short track. Oh, nope, now new short track package at a road course. Oh, wait, now new short track package in Virginia at Richmond. Is that advantageous? If we were to put Harrison Burton in a better situation, could he have produced better results? Now, of course, other drivers have been able to do that. But they're bigger teams, so it's not as much of a disadvantage. They're much more experienced. It's not as much of a disadvantage. They have more simulators, so it's not as much of a disadvantage. But now we get a situation where at the very least, we get this package back-to-back -back weeks. We're sticking in their home state of Virginia where the Wood Brothers are located. And if there's any place where they can really make some improvements, if there was ever a time where they could make some gains, where we could put them in a more beneficial Position, this would be it. Harrison Burton, your DEI DFS play of the week. So thank you for bearing with me on that rant. I may go deeper into that one of these days. Not necessarily to get political, but to give that idea of, you know, raising the, you know, whatever. Let's just stop talking about it and move on before I anger anyone. Thanks for bearing with me. I really do appreciate you guys. Leave a like, share the video. Subscribe to the channel. I really do truly love your support, all the comments, everything. Please, if you haven't joined us, join us. Venmo, PayPal, Cash App. So easy to do. So easy to use the sheet. Save tons of time. Join the revolution, baby. We are growing. We are building something here. The channel's big. People are piling into the spreadsheet. We're seeing people move over from other channels and come on in. And we are welcoming. We are inviting. There's something special going on. I can feel it. Be a part of this. Be a part of this team. We want you here. Stenhouse, always anomalous. Overall, the results haven't been that good. They haven't been that bad. We'd expect his driver rating to be a little bit more towards the other side of the top 20. At least he is being consistent. That is one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of seasons, which is interesting. Stenhouse is more consistent but slower. He's less mercurial. What we had grown to expect from Stenhouse over the years was a guy that was an all or nothing riverboat gambler, could get some really solid finishes, but also could wreck out more. He's become much more mild and tame, but in becoming more mild and tame, he's just getting more lackluster. So it's hard to get excited about these driver ratings, but we do need to kind of get ourselves into a different viewpoint of who Stenhouse is because it doesn't seem like the old Stenhouse. Now, surprisingly, again, there could be some value here because the finishes don't line up with where he's running. He is running better than where he's finishing. And so at some point, there's going to be a regression to the mean, and the tide's going to turn. And instead of running 25th and finishing 33rd, he runs 25th and finishes 18th. And at a $6,000 price point that's been suppressed by uh, results that don't necessarily reflect his ability, that will work. You, If we say I only need 18 points out of Corey LaJoy, the same carries over for Ricky Stenhouse. And where I don't know if I can get it out of LaJoy, I believe much more confidently that I can get it. If he can run in the top 25, if he can hang on to the lead lap, when you look, last year he finished eighth. Got a 19th place finish in the fall. I'm chugging a lot of wicked liquid today. Wicked. So, Stenhouse. Actually, I will bump him up to a two. Todd Gill and gotta love Gilly. Gilly was great at Martinsville in the truck series. You can go through his numbers. You can check out previous podcasts that I've done. He's been good at this track in this series. He ran well at Richmond last week. It looks like his car is fast. And now they just roll it into Martinsville. 
place where he has been strong. I love it. He's number three. And if he is good, then Michael McDowell is good. And Michael McDowell's numbers are very similar to Stenhouse's numbers. And at this price point of $6,300, can I get 20, 25 points from him? Yes. Could that get the job done? It absolutely could. Is it going to create value and open up my lineups? Yes, he will. And Michael McDowell is a guy that sometimes during the season is costing us $8,000 at an intermediate track. He's just not producing the results that we're expecting at the moment. A 31 at Coda. A 30 at Richmond. Now, he didn't really run very well last week, but and that does worry us. But he did have a strong Phoenix race. So we probably don't want to overreact here. We know that this has been a very strong quality driver and arguably a top 20 driver over the last several seasons. And to get him at 6,300, yeah, he's there too. McDowell, Gilliland, Stenhouse. We would prefer them over this crew. At the bottom, I'm going to go Burton. I am going to look at Haley. Well, Joy is a possibility. But Sten Alice, yeah, I like him more. Gil and I like him even more, and I will talk McDowell. Now, to Austin Sendrick. The guy that did the crew chief switching with Harrison Burton. He now has Brian Wilson. He had Jeremy Bullins. Bullens is now with Burton and no longer has Wilson. Both have had moderate success. Now, Bullens has had a little bit more success in the Cup Series than Wilson. Wilson has never really been that good of a position in the Cup Series. But Wilson had a ton of success in the Xfinity Series. But then again, in the Xfinity Series, when Wilson was down there, they weren't running Burton's very often at all. Needless to say... $6,400 for a premier Penske ride. It's tough to pass. Has Cinder Crumb well this year? No, he hasn't. But if we're willing to dismiss some of the previous results for Harrison Burton or accept them, and I get it, it's easier because they're a much smaller team and excuses can be made for Harrison Burton. Sure, that makes sense. But we're only talking a thousand dollars more and i get it the excuses make sense from the small team perspective but if we're making excuses from a dfs perspective and trying to excuse something if we're willing to do it for a 5400 hundred dollar driver we should be willing to make those same adjustments for a driver with similar but better results right look at his last four he's got two good ones two better than burton more expensive, but given the equipment, it's really not that bad. Has he run well this season? No. But did he run better at Richmond? Well, yes, in comparison to Burton. Yes, in comparison to what he's done this season. Is his team moving in a little bit better of a direction? Sure, they are. You know, you look at Phoenix, he got into a wreck. So we can dismiss that. Las Vegas isn't terrible. Bristol was Bristol. You know, what are you going to do? Coda, disappointing day for sure. But Richmond, not that bad. Again, if we just need 18 points from McDowell or 20 points, then I think Cindric is also viable at that spot. And I like that all these guys aren't as obvious. There really isn't a shiny option. I think Gillen stands out a little bit, but not much. I give Gillen a lot of credit, way too much respect, because I've always liked the guy. That's just one of my weaknesses. But most people out there in the DFS community are not going to see him as the high poppy. Every one of these guys are pretty much in the same mixed bag, so ownership should spread out until we see qualifying, and then obviously you know how that's going to play. I'm simply not interested in John Hernemichek. For whatever reason, this Toyota has not shown enough speed. It's not bad, right? I probably should give him a little bit more credit. The rating rank works. The finishes are working. But he's going to cost you a little bit more. I mean, yeah, he is, I guess, just as in play as these other drivers. And he has been just as a consistent, if not more, than Stenhouse and... McDowell, possibly. 
So you can go in that direction. But if I can just spend $100 more for a Toyota that has demonstrated speed, then that's where I'm going to go. Eric Jones, 6,600. Can run inside the top 20. Can hang on to the lead lap. Has speed. Got the 31st of Phoenix. We know he had a top 10 car at times during that race. Got into that late race wreck. Last week at Richmond, again, was able to show the speed. If not for traffic, probably had a little bit better average running position. So I don't see this as like too much of a finishing position inflation. I mean, if we go through all these drivers that we've went through so far, 6,600 and down, even 7,000 and down, if we elevated all the way up here to Noah Gregson, and maybe Noah has a, a case. But if we're saying who among them has the best shot at the top 15 based on what we have seen this season, it's going to be Eric Jones. Now, I know he hasn't really produced all that much at Martinsville, but he's been close. He's there. This is the best car that he's had. I think a lot of what last year, I mean, you look at this, he finished 21st at Martinsville last year. That was a lame duck Chevy if you'd ever seen one or Ford. I can't even remember what. That was Chevy, I think. Remember, they were transitioning at Legacy over to Toyota. They had lost wind tunnel time. They lost developmental time. They were basically selling their cars and their parts. Probably had team members changing around. And the least finished 21st and second to last race of the season, the penultimate race of the season. That's not bad. Could expect some big gains from Eric Jones. Top 15 is not out of the question. And so if we can get there, that's great. And Really, what we're looking at so far in terms of building lineups is you're probably going to like the 6K range and maybe take two drivers from the 6K range, and you could quite possibly avoid Haley and LaJoy. But then again, you could take Haley and a 6K driver and really open up your lineup. But I'm spending so much time on this spot because this is probably where the GPP is going to be made or broken. This is your make or break spot. Austin Dillon hasn't been thrilling this season, but he has on occasion had some pretty solid races at Martinsville. Pretty familiar with the track. Been here in the trucks, been here in the cups a bazillion times. You want to play the new crew chief bounce game with him. I feel like we've played that with him more than anyone else. Name me a driver that's changed crew chiefs. You know, at some point you just look in the mirror and say, Maybe the crew chief's not the problem, but then again, I've been doing this podcast so long that I remember saying that last time he changed crew chiefs. I've been doing this podcast so long, over a decade, that I remember the time before that where you say, look, we were changing every other variable and the results aren't changing. Maybe in our experiment, we got the wrong control. Maybe Dylan is the thing that we need to swap out. Either way, Richmond last week wasn't bad. Um, now you're saying the 26th, that's not good. I'm worried about RCR. So he had a pit road issue very early in the race, went two laps down. He was never able to get back to the lead lap. And so he may have had speed, just never able to demonstrate it. He actually liked his car a decent bit. So let's say, let's pretend that at least it was a 20th place car. We'll take that. We'll take Austin Dillon a 20th place car at 6,800. RCR team that occasionally his pit crew can be absolutely elite. Boost him up on pit road. He could get to that top 15 spot that we want. Similar to Jones. And he could go under own because he's just not producing the results that people want to see. On top of that, people just generally don't like Austin Dillon feel like if he could get his head reshaped or possibly have a different haircut, um, he could help his ownership a little bit. <laughs> I don't know. I sometimes wonder what these drivers do to, like, man, do you want to be popular? Do you want people a little like you? Are you even trying to sell sponsorship? Of course, like, he doesn't have to sell sponsorship. So he can just do whatever he wants. Like, he could put a, well, I was going to say something stupid, but. Whereas Joey Logano is out there putting on a toupee to make sure he can stay in the sport. 
Like they're all putting on glasses and trying to look like they're on a GQ cover. You're telling me that all of a sudden these drivers need to wear glasses? I don't think so. These guys are trying to do brand appeal. Suarez never really been good here. Not super excited. Track house has never really been that great either. Noah Gregson. So here's the thing, digging deep, that you might like about old Noah Gregson. He was pretty good in the Xfinity series of this track. Didn't produce last year for Neg Legacy or in his part-time ride in 22. But if we look at Drew Flickens Durfer and what he has accomplished at this track, he has been here a lot going back to 2009. Solid results, but what you really love is what Blickensdurfer did for this 10 car over the last four seasons. With Eric Amarola, 2022 spring, they finished eighth, 15th in the fall, sixth in the spring of last year, and they were runner up last fall. He was optimal in two of those races, or both races last season. And I think Amarola has been often, I think I wrote in my free article at DK Nation, like four of the last six Martinsville races, the number 10 was an optimal pick. That's encouraging. At 7,100, he definitely could be one of the better value plays. So there it is. That's why we dig deep here. That's why I do this. I love finding these things. I love digging into the research and finding these little things that other people don't talk about. I love sharing them with you. So thank you for being a part of it. I hope it helps you out. You can help me out, PayPal, Venmo, Cash App. Join us. Join the spreadsheet. Join the comments. It's easy, guys. Leave a comment, leave a like, share, subscribe. Send over a quick PayPal on your phone. And look, I'll save you a bunch of time with this sheet. Make your life easier. Join the revolution. All right, Ryan Priest, 20th and 15th. Once he gets into an SHR car, we know Stuart Haas Fords have been pretty, pretty fast in these short flat track packages, but you may not be that encouraged by that. And ultimately, Priest has let me down recently. Um, I may have inflated his expectations in Phoenix a little too much. I know he didn't get the good result, but that was because he played strategy, ran out of fuel, thought he could have had a better finish, but maybe I hyped him up a little too much. He went into Richmond and was decent, but I expected a lot more from a guy that tested at, at Richmond. Didn't work out for him, but he did have a top 20 car. So I couldn't completely bury him at the moment, but maybe I hyped him up a little bit too much. So then we look at Martinsville, 20th and 15th. Now 20th and 15th is much more appealing in the mid sixes. Once we in the sevens, not that great. But if we look closer at the 20 and the 15th, last year when he finished 20th in the fall, his average running position was 11th. Last spring, when he finished 15th, his average running position was 14th. That's a top 15 car. It is only 7,200. Is it more? Yes. But for whatever reason, DraftKings understands that, yeah, he's not that bad. Let a bunch of laps here in the past. Josh Berry saved his career at Martinsville. You remember this. Part-time ride, junior motorsports, knocked it out of the park. And you'll remember from previous podcasts over the years, we've talked about Josh Berry and his love affair with Martinsville. We know that outside of the Cars Tour and your traditional late model series exists, the Virginia Triple Crown, Langley, Sobo in South Boston, and then the Bees Knees, Martinsville. And we see hundreds of late model drivers unload and only half make the field and then only one wins. Josh Berry has a win. I think he has a couple second place finishes as well. He knows this track. Rodney Childers is a good crew chief. And this team may not be as strong as it once was. His engineers, they may not still have Cheddar Bob, if we remember Cheddar Bob. But last week was a big step forward. Yes, of course, he used those wet tires to make some significant gains on the field. But he also didn't qualify as well as he should have. And once he got to the front, he ran well with the driver rating of sixth at a short flat track. Where in the Xfinity Series last year, he almost won. 
if there is a racetrack where he can absolutely compete with the big boys, if there's a racetrack where we could feel confident in Josh Berry getting a top 15, just think to yourself, look at all the tracks. Where are we likely to see Josh Berry getting a top 15? Where do the stars align for Josh Berry? SHR Ford. It's going to be Martinsville. At 7,400. You like Priest at 72? Then why don't you like Josh Berry at 74? You do. Now, going up into the sevens may require us to go down with our, sec our final value play in the fives. That's fine. It may work out after practice and qualifying. We get some drivers up in the top five that are very affordable, that can lead laps. Cool. Next group I find very fascinating from Bush to Briscoe. Now, the note I hear or have with Briscoe is from Eric Jones on the radio this week talking about Martinsville being a completely different track in this package. It's just so much easier with the shifty. He said there is no finesse anymore. In the past, they never reached full throttle. Car was breaking loose. It was out of control going in. You really had to manage your throttle times. You really had to ease back into it. For 500 laps or for 1,000 exits, you had to make sure that you didn't get too hot on that machine or you didn't drive in too hot in that machine coming from a guy who used to sit right there eight rows up between turns three and four because they're the cheapest place possible and it's very easy to get in and out of those bleachers and carry whatever you wanted into that glorious little uh, track at martinsville covered in rubber and fumes by the end of the day not so much intoxicated by beverages, but more so the fumes and the rubber. There was a day when drivers would constantly wreck into turns three because they came in too hot, because there was consistent wheel hop, because they were so aggressive in a car that was out of control. Have you noticed that we don't see that as much anymore? Because the car is not out of control going into three, going into two. And upon exit, you just mash it to the floor and you're fine. In the past, if you mashed it into the floor, you're into the wall. The finesse is gone. The playing field is even. Everything has been equalized. That's what Jones was talking about. And we have done that, and we have seen a significant change in the field where drivers that were not good before have become good at this track. And we have seen some drivers who were excellent, far superior, have seen some of their advantages taken away when the finesse disappeared. And Briscoe was one of the drivers who benefits from, and no disrespect to Briscoe, but he clearly is a guy that went from not good at this track to once we put on the training wheels, once we turned on the bumpers in the bowling lanes, he's fine. Drive it in hard, throw it in the third, mash it to the floor, full throttle. Jones said we never reached full throttle a lot of times on the backstretch. Now they are. Just mash it. Drive some circles. Lap her around. It's worked out for Briscoe. Top fives in the last two. Top tens in the last four. Here we are again. Same old package. Same thing. 7,500. Yeah. And I believe that's the same phenomenon as playing out with Bubba Wallace, another driver that wasn't great. Now. Bo Wallace never had the greatest equipment, but I would argue that if Richard Petty Motorsports is putting together pretty solid cars at specific tracks, Martinsville is always going to be one that they were going to have a close eye on, and his results were decent. And he has improved as his equipment has gotten better. So his growth or change may not be as closely related to the package as it is for Briscoe, but nonetheless, he has been successful at Martinsville in this package, and I would expect that success to continue. He's another driver that can run in the top 10, that can lead laps. It's a little bit of a stretch, but he can, can get fast laps as long as he puts together a good race. And with him, we know Briscoe had probably his worst race of the season. He said it was his worst race of the season. They still were a top 20 car, which is nice. but. Bubba had a great race. Should have had a top five. Very good day. Just doing Bubba stuff at the end. That's fine. You know, whatever. Some people are never going to change. 
I don't mind. I mean, I guess if you play them in DFS, but you better just get used to it. Alex Bowman's a bit of a more trickier situation. You look at his win in 21, kind of another backdoor win, but also in a different package, overpowered. The results have been okay. I worry not having Greg Ives. Greg Ives is who Dale Earnhardt Jr. won at Martinsville with. And last week, he just had a ho-hum day. If I'm just going to get a top 15 from Alex Bowman, then you're paying too much. I believe I can get a top 15 from Jones or Dylan or all the guys below him. And Bowman has not demonstrated that he can do any much more than that. I know it's a small sample size, but we look at Richmond. We look at Phoenix. Wasn't there. The races where he stood out were kind of standout races. Bristol being its own thing. Coda being its own thing. And we don't even have to put any credit into Las Vegas, but even at Las Vegas, he didn't really do much for us. Now, all of that being said, 7,700 for a Hendrick Motorsports car going to Martinsville for the 40th anniversary of the win that saved the organization. As far as narrative street goes, yeah, it's the play of the week. As far as the data goes, I don't know so much. We'll see what happens throughout the weekend if he has some speed. Kyle Busch. All right. What do we do about this? An 8,100 Kyle Busch. as a live and breathe. Very surprising. Another driver that has seen his results steadily decline in the new package. That is a bit worrisome. We've seen him not run very well this year. Phoenix, of course, he had a bunch of issues, but even when between the issues, didn't look like the car had the speed. Didn't really like the setup. Last week again, just didn't have the setup. It was a miss. At 8,100, Kyle Busch is always going to be in play. At 8,100, Kyle Busch can be a play based on give me 10 place differential points in the top 10. If all we are asking for Bush is a 10th and 10 place differential points, then I am very interested. Starts 20th, finishes 10th. Huh, it might work. But can he even get to 10th? You know, if we zoom out and look at his entire career, of course he can get to 10th. We zoom in from the micro level from this year or the last couple of years. I don't know if he can get a 10th at Martinsville. I don't know as we go up and look at these drivers ranked ahead of him. Is he going to beat these guys? Is he faster than the four JGR? Is he faster than three Hendricks? Is he faster than some 2311s? Is he faster than a couple SHRs and RFKs? There's a lot of cars in front of him that he has to be better than. And at the moment, he has not been better than them. So how does he get into the top 10? And then we've got guys back here that we feel like has some upside and could be better than Kyle Busch. So simply slotting him in for a top 10 and 10 place differential points is not as easy as we think it would be. So he's not a jam him in three spot. He's not a one in terms of I don't like him because he is Kyle Busch. But he's right there in the middle. And what we really are waiting to see is, is he happy with his car this weekend? And if he is, or if they start off on the right foot, they feel like they're making gains and they're headed in the right direction and can tune on it during the race, then we're leaning that way. If he is terrible in practice, then that should scare you away. Ross Chastain has not been good at this track. You're going to see these two top fives. But again, because I appreciate you and I know that you come here for some deep analysis and some hard work. While you guys are filtering into this channel, it's not just this guy sucks, this guy's good, this guy sucks. And then a lot of times the guys that are said that suck are actually really good. And the guys that are good actually suck. <laughs> if I make a statement, as always, if you've been watching this for years, anytime I ever say anything, I have something to support it. There's always evidence. I don't just say someone stinks. I try to separate my bias as best as I possibly can. I try to be as objective as I possibly can. And I think that you appreciate it. And you can tell by the work that I put into this. You can see it with the spreadsheet data. That's why I really want you to join. That's why I love doing it. And that's why I really get a kick out of doing it. I mean, 
to be affirmed and confirmed and well received because of the hard work. It really means a lot. The likes, the subscribes, the sharing, the people moving over to this channel, the people recognizing the hard work and that, hey, if you're going to make pick, pick videos, if you're going to break people down based on value, and you're going to say this guy's the play, then you need to say why he is the play. You need to provide some data and some reasoning and logic. I've always done that in the past. And I got into trouble previous podcasts with people because they never really wanted to go down that route. They just wanted to dismiss people. I'm like, all right, well, how did you get there? What was your deductive reasoning? And then they never could. It was always just some biased nonsense. So that's what I really tried to provide here. So we're looking at Ross Chastain. You see these fifth place finishes. And Field's going to see the fifth place finishes. And they may like yeah, 14th and 13th. They're not that bad. But if we look close at the fifth place finishes, hopefully you all remember that that fall 22 was the Hail Melon. Melon. Hail Melon. And then if we look closer at the 22 spring race where he finished fifth, he had an average running position of 14th. So for all intents and purposes, he's really just been a 15th place driver. At $8,300, this has not been a good track for him. And I don't think it's necessarily a place where we expect track house to run well. That's why I gave him a one. It wasn't, oh, he's just not good. Okay, if he's not good, why not? Please provide me the data. Please give me some objective analysis. That's what we're here for. That's why this spreadsheet exists. That's why you want to be a part of this. It makes it so easy, saving that time. Get in here, we're building it here, folks. Something special is going on. We're seeing a sea change. We're starting a movement. Chris Busher. Yeah, he's in play, but I'm not super excited. He's not too expensive, but just echoing the sentiment that Brad Kozlowski has been saying recently, the RFKs are fast. They have top 10 cars, but we don't have winning cars. And once I start to get this price point, I need winning cars. There. Now. The next guy could be a winning car. Some people say this guy stinks. Some people say this guy sucks. Um, some people could just point to he won a championship. He's won plenty of races. He's won at Martinsville. Um, he's got fast laps and laps led at Martinsville. If you do want to make the claim that Chase Elliott is not very good, then I believe the claim would be that these finishes, although finishing position is overrated, may be the result of the new package and that Elliot can't race in it. But then that really doesn't hold up with the fact that he led a bunch of laps here. So if you are solely looking at finishing position only, which a lot of the field will do, then you're going to, oh, Chase Elliott stinks. He sucks. All right. Great research. Now, if you are actually looking at the data and doing your due diligence, which I do, I try, then clearly just looking right here is enough. Clearly just looking right here is enough. If you've watched my videos, if you've seen me break down Richmond, which I did, check that out earlier this week, every lap, not just the quick, he stinks, this guy sucks. No, I go through the laps. I break down the races. I did it for Richmond. I did it for Phoenix. Elliott had a top five car at Phoenix. They played the pit strategy wrong. They did not get the finish they deserved. That suppresses his driver rating. He ran half the race inside the top five. How does one drive half of a race in a brand new package inside the top five and stink? I will wait for that answer in the comments. If the driver is not very good, how is it possible that they run half of the race inside the top five at Phoenix, but they stink? Waiting, okay. Next, if that driver is not very good, how is it possible that they again have a top driver rating at Richmond? And we also know, because we do our homework, that the caution came during an inopportune time for Chase Elliott that made him change or at least affected their strategy. All in all, it was a decent car, he said. Is he better than JGR Torres? No, that's not what we're talking about. 
Is he good? Yes. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills sometimes when I hear things. Chase Elliott isn't any good. Uh, look, I get bias. I understand hating specific drivers. But there really is no place in providing information to paying customers for bias. I want you to be a part of this. I don't want my bias to affect any of that. I wanna to try to provide the best work I possibly can. I really do love helping you guys out. I really get so fascinated by these numbers and I wanna serve you the best that I can. And part of that is giving you truth and like not going hot take city on you and not being lazy on you. Like here's what the numbers say, like it or not, I can't help it. You know, going back to that DEI thing, a lot of that comes from the Harvard economist, Roland Fryer, who did all of the police studies. And he's, he went in thinking, oh, yep, cops are bad. And then he looks at the data and finds out that, you know, actually everything we know is wrong. And he didn't want to believe it, but he didn't care because his job as an economist is, here's what the numbers say. It doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter what you want. It doesn't matter what your beliefs or bias are. You hate Chase Elliott, cool. You hate rich kids, cool. The eight kids with advantages, cool. But who cares? If the numbers say a guy is good, he's good. Chase Elliott is good. Is that a rant? I don't think that's a rant. Ty Gibbs, how about another rich kid? Didn't work out for him at Richmond, but we've explained that in the previous video. If it wasn't for a speeding penalty and it wasn't for the wet tires early in the race, his average running position would have been better. His finish would have been better. Not a good restart at the very end. He had climbed all the way back up to 12th place. So really no reason to hit the panic button on Ty Gibbs. But um, I don't know if I love him knowing that the other JGR Toyos are just so much more experienced at this track. Now, a lot of people, though, are going to look and say, well, he hasn't been that great here. He got like, spun out 17 million times in the last race. He had a pretty good race car and had a chance to lead laps. So... Uh, if you can get some leverage, I suppose Ty Gibbs would definitely be a spot to investigate because at 9,000, it seems like it's not like, you know, we've got him at 8,000 and he was a steal. At 10,000, it was a no. Where does he fall at 9,000 at a Martinsville marked up against some pretty strong drivers and some pretty sub average results? I would say his ownership is going to be low. I would say he's going to be less trusted. And there's a leverage spot here because we know he's running extremely well this year. We know his Toyota is just as fast as anybody's. And again, as I mentioned, got spun out a bunch last year. If we were to pull it up, which you can, if you have joined the revolution, you can look through and see all the specific events that affect the driver, the context that helps you evaluate look, lap 303, 54 spins. And that was another spin after contact. So. These are things that help you out, help separate you from the rest. We do things different here. Special place. I skipped over Tyler Reddick. I'm sorry. I just has never been good at this track. Brad Kozlowski, probably going to be a no for me because we are spending a lot more now. And as he has said himself, they don't quite have race winning speed. Once we get up into this tier, I really need laps period, end of story, because if I roster him, there uh, the opportunity cost is I probably am unlikely to roster one of these drivers. Now, if he does start in the pool, it is worth consideration. That's a good reminder here on the podcast to go over where do our Hulk points or Dominator points come from. Obviously, we get some two big scores, but even a third one often. Sometimes you could get a fourth in, but typically we are looking at three drivers at lead laps from fast laps. For the most part, they're coming from those front two rows. But on occasion, we will also see these guys that just miss out on the next round of qualifying. You know, this guy's starting 11th and 12th. If they could have advanced to the next round, they quite possibly could have been starting up here. They have decent speed. So that's why you see this little bit of a, a zoom up of a 29.2 average from the 11 spots. Something to keep your eye on this weekend. And as you can see, you know, Chase Elliott sucks. Oh, by the way, he averages the most all points over the last, what, eight races? Yeah, but he sucks.
Joe Logano. The numbers are pretty strong. Both packages. Did we overreact to his struggles early in the season? Well, he got in a wreck at Phoenix. Bristol was Bristol. Hey, not a bad code today. Hey, finish his second is phenomenal at Richmond in a night race, where if you follow my tweet, you look back at the previous night races, you had to do your homework. You couldn't just simply go into racing reference and hit next breaks, next race. You had to research. Oh, wait, they didn't run night races. They stopped doing these back in 2020. You had to go look. I think 2021, 2019 and before to find when they were doing those. And you could find that the night races, which is a different animal, guys, especially when you're practicing during the day. Different beast. And it was JGR Toyotas and it was Joey Logano. And so last weekend, turn the lights out. Nighttime race. Richmond, Logano's back. And now he's back in the track where he has run well. And it didn't seem like the Penske Forge were that far off, to be honest. We saw Blaney running really competitive laps at Phoenix. He had a borderline top five car. I believe his driver rating was sixth. Well, I mean, it's probably on the screen here. Fifth. So, yeah, Penske Fords were fine. Not that far off. Is he going to be the quote-unquote dominator of this race? No. Could he lead laps during a stint of this race? Absolutely. He is in that conversation. I really need to bump Blaney up. All of these drivers, now a handful, could be dominators, a couple. But Logano, Blaney, Blaney could dominate. He did win this race last year, but it wasn't really a dominant performance. Could he lead a stint of this race, Logano and Blaney? Absolutely. They have all done it. And you're more than likely going to need two of these drivers. I believe that. When it's all said and done, three of them probably will finish with the third most top three in fantasy points. But I strongly believe that you're not going to be able to afford all three of them. Maybe if it's Logano, it can work. Maybe Logano doesn't score the most points, but he doesn't have to score the most points based on point per dollar play. But ultimately, I believe you're looking at getting two of these guys in your lineup. William Byron. So got to give credit to Cruz for pointing out that, and I really do appreciate him going over ownership. And I give credit to him for talking about, hey, man, Byron's going on their own. Now, I'm actually kind of surprised that he doesn't understand why William Byron was under owned last week. Um, I think it's obvious why William Byron was under owned last week. I think sometimes we get caught up too much in the DFS game theory. We get caught up too much in our own bubble. And that's one of the things that I'm always trying to do is step back, zoom out, think of things from a different angle, think of things from a different point of view, be as objective as possible. Don't get lost in race for the prize world. And once you do that, it's very easy to understand. Why wasn't people rostering William Byron? Are you guys crazy? No. The normal DFS player is not diving into this. The normal, you are not normal. And I don't mean that in a bad way. You like NASCAR. You like data. You want to win some money. That's why you're here. That's why you're a part of this special thing. That's why we're building something. A lot of people aren't here. A lot of people aren't going over lap by lap breakdowns. A lot of people are simply looking at finishing position. It's that simple. It's not a grand mystery. William Byron went under-owned because his finishing position was weak at Richmond last year. A lot of DFS NASCAR players don't do any work. A lot of DFS NASCAR touts don't do any work. And then a lot of DFS NASCAR touts push on, I'm not saying that's Cruz, I'm saying in general, that lazy work onto their lazy viewers. I don't think anyone should be offended out here because I'm not lazy and you're not lazy. You're here with me. And the people that are here with me, a part of this, we're a different breed. We're a different animal. You're here to put in work. You're here to learn, to educate, to master. You're not here for picks. You're not here for this guy sucks or this guy's good. You ask why. I answer why. 
because I want to know why. And so it was pretty obvious to me when Cruz was scratching his head about why is his ownership so low? What the hell's going on? They just looked at finishing position, man. They didn't know that he got hit on pit road early in the Richmond fall race. They don't know that he got wrecked by Christopher Bell on a late restart in the Richmond spring race. They're just looking at the damn number on the screen. They're just following the number that their tout gave them. And so it was an easy fade for them. We're going in another direction. A simple nudge to say, oh, I just played Toyotas because this guy didn't do well at Richmond last year. There's not much more to it. The idea that everyone is pouring over this data, well, I wish it were the case because this channel would be exploding. We are exploding, but we are not as big as we could be or should be because ultimately some people just don't want to put in that much work. But for you out there that do want to put in and give it, I'm here for you. would love for you to join PayPal Venmo Cash App. Check out the spreadsheet. It is so easy to use. It'll save you so much time. The people that have been here have been here for years. And we are really starting to break on through to the other side. So come on, man. Get in here. Get it done. That's why. And so to think that this William Byron trend is going to continue, no, don't. It's not going to happen. The idea that, well, I mean, it could. He finished 13th and 23rd last year, but I think they'll look even closer and see that he does have some strong results. So the idea that William Byron being under owned forever is going to be a trend, I don't know. I believe it was more of a case. And I could be wrong. Look, I will definitely admit it if I'm wrong. I'll step back. And if people want to uh, criticize my comments or you know, maybe look deeper at what I'm saying, that's fine. I am always open to it. But I really think that was a one-off based on Richmond finishing position. Bell's awesome. Had to deal with plenty of issues last week. Speeding penalty. So he's good. Checkbox. It's fine. Uh, maybe people bail out on him. I don't know why. He's got the results in Martinsville. Sure, he wasn't the best at Richmond last week, but he has absolutely been fine. Again, you can watch the Richmond recap video. Speeding penalty. Boom. That's going to ruin his day. And when you're dancing with the elite, when you're expected to lead, you can't misstep. It's just the way that it is. I mean, he drove through the field twice. Again, just look at the lap by lap data. Blaney, I don't care about Richmond. It has not been a strong racetrack for him. You can go through the data, go through everything. That's what we said last week going into the race. That's what he did. That is fine. It's just not his place. Martinsville is a strong racetrack for him. Phoenix has been a strong racetrack for him. We're not really asking him to crush, although it would be nice. But is there a possibility he could score in the top three in fantasy points? Yeah. Can he get a top three? Sure. Can he lead a stint of the race in a package where you can't really pass that much? Sure. So there it is. You can't say the same for a lot of the drivers in the field. I mean, basically, until we get to these green spots, we're not considering anybody that has a very solid chance of leading laps. We're only really looking six drivers that we are really that happy with. And as far as Truex and Larson goes, you know the story. I don't need to sell you on anything. Obviously, I'm going to lean Truex more. I mean, where is Hamlin at? Why is... Oh, sorry. There's Hamlin. Hamlin, Larson, Truex. I like Hamlin the most. Actually, I like Truex the most. Then Hamlin. And then Larson. The JGR Tour has just have been much faster. But Larson has just as much of a chance. This does have that Hendrick narrative on it. I think that the gap has closed a little bit. And Larson has been doing a phenomenal job in qualifying, or at least he did last week. And really, that goes a long way. We have seen that with previous drivers where you may not have trusted or believed in them, but starting on the front row, and they just have the advantage of leading a bunch of laps. Maybe they fade a little bit, but they lead for enough of the race. And then maybe they pick up some fast laps later on that it works out. Either way, I believe in Larson's speed. I believe in Hamlin's speed. They're good to go. So that's going to close it. We went deep. We covered everything. I you know, love you guys. I'm so blessed to have you around. Thanks for joining. Share this channel with other people. Share the hard work with other people, especially hardworking people that want to be a part of this thing, help this thing grow, building it. We've got something special going on. I think you guys are all starting to recognize that and realize that there is something happening here.
that uh, in previous years with my podcast and with the spreadsheets, it was just a spreadsheet. It was just a podcast. It was just a live show. You know, it was just a thing I was doing. There wasn't anything really resonating, but, and I know that you know that, and you know, I mean, that we haven't had this feeling in a while, but it may remember, feel kind of almost like, you know, those fan vice days. It may feel like, you know, that 2019 year where I got the new baby. I got to put my heart and soul into this. And so here we are again. We got that feeling back. And I just blessed to have you guys around. Chips Light's fantastic.